Howdy doody, how are you? Welcome to At Home on InView TV. And although we've got a wonderful concert venue behind us, don't you love the backdrop? I can't believe that it's light, those clocks changing. Isn't it wonderful? I feel I'm in the middle of the day and got a beautiful sunset. You can't see it, but I can. <laughs> and I'm an naughty boy. Well, of course, welcome to At Home on InView TV. I am William Broom in Sydney, and we're going out on Facebook, YouTube, and oboe play. We speak to people in the industries of music, writing, politics, business, the arts, and sport. You name it, we've got the people at the top of the ladder on At Home on InView TV, our show. We love it. And even better, we love the fact that you are with us. We're going into summer, so we're getting warmer, we're getting hotter, we're getting a tan, we're putting on the sun screen but even better we get to have your company and on today's show we've got a very special guest somebody who i love and adore one of my favorite australian singers she has worked for the likes of jimmy barnes richard clapton cold chisel and noise works many of you will know her from pop stars live all together now and of course beauty and the beast and of course you would have probably seen her at many of the sydney gay and lesbian mardi gras events or the harbour parties you name it she has done it she has performed around the world of course i am talking i am so excited about the one and the only shauna jensen but before we meet her and she'll be joining us in a moment from the central coast let's find out a little bit more about her can't wait Listen as your day unfolds Challenge what the future holds Try to keep your head up to the sky Lovers, they may cause you tears Go ahead, release your fears Stand up and be counted Don't be ashamed to cry You gotta be bad, you gotta be bold You gotta be wiser You gotta be hard, you gotta be tough You gotta be stronger Care what your mother said Read the books your father read Try to solve the puzzles In your own sweet time To feel so uninspired And when I knew I had to face another day Lord, it made me feel so tired Before the day I met you My life was so unkind You're the key to my peace of mind Dreams 
I am so excited. You are, of course, watching at home on InView TV, going out on Oboe Play, Facebook and YouTube. Amazing music and a <laughs> what a voice. And joining us on the Central Coast is the woman herself, Shauna Jensen. Welcome. How are you? Hi, Hi William. Mwah. Lovely to see you. I am so honoured to have you on our programme. I've wanted you for a while and I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're here because I've followed your career. I know I... I am just, whatever it is, pining at the moment and giving you lots of compliments, but they are from the heart. And oh, thank you. I, we saw you with Bob Down at the end there, and I saw you with him performing at Trevor Ashley's Show Queens um, at Pado RSL here in Sydney just the other weekend. What was it like to be performing again? Ah, oh, amazing. Um, the that show queen uh, at the Paddington RSL was just absolutely amazing and it was great for all of us to be with an audience it was fantastic to be with a live band um and you know just to be in a room with, where everybody was just feeling that same vibe that you were feeling probably of just being joyous of being in the room i have done a couple of gigs um you know claire de lune uh claire de lune's um Claire's Kitchen at Le Salon was, has been probably one of the very few venues that have been able to operate live. And I did a cabaret there in July and I did one, uh, my Christmas in July show. And I did another show just with Piano Player a few weeks ago with Andrew Warboys. And that was fantastic, but you know, 30 people versus 80 people mm. it's very very different but i was grateful to be able to do that and um i've been doing you know iso shows i started a little group called leso in lockdown and um did a few iso shows which was great because people were very kind to oh excuse me people were very kind to watch it and mm. um you know help buy me a glass of rosé or you know whatever so that was really nice to get tips from people because it's been really hard yes. this I, whole thing has just been hard and i've been loving leso in lockdown it's been amazing you've been taking song requests and it's very entertaining and it's great that people are taking this opportunity to use technology like Facebook to still entertain yeah. everybody, but also perhaps reach people who don't come into Sydney, who don't come into the inner city and mm -hmm. to reach out. But what I want to know, I want to go way, way further back. You've been celebrating recently 50 years in showbiz. How did you, it's amazing. What an accolade, what a milestone. How did you first get involved in the music industry? <laughs> um when I look I am quite genetically blessed my my on my mother's side my maternal, maternal side of my family my mom's my grandfather was a beautiful singer apparently although I never met him and my mother's elder sister Angela who is I have my middle name is Angela she was a professional opera singer and I've never actually had to work very hard at the actual singing i've had to work hard at the craft but it's been something that's come very naturally to me and i've just always done it since i was a kid and i i've used this analogy before of when i was about seven i uh, maybe eight i was in a local television uh, television i was in a local talent school at the presbyterian church that was run by miss roderick who i think was a lesbian lived with her um companion in the house and she wore um she wore tartan skirts and sup hose stockings and brown shoes and twin sets with pearls so she's definitely a lesbian of that time so we're talking the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. And um, a talent scout from Channel 7 came to the, sh to the school and I got to go to appear on television singing A Dream Is A Wish Your Heart Makes. And I, there, were, there were these two gentlemen, like you could never have this, was so on PC, uh, Uncle Reggie and Uncle Somebody Else. And um, I think it might've even been called The Tarax Show or something. 
and they had a little chat to me and then they said now just go through that door and that was the set they were in like banana chairs mm. and i walked through this door to sing this song and i kind of think that that i never walked out of the door i just kept going you know it was like it opened my my life up and i just i just have never wanted to do anything else and so i've I've always just followed that path. And when I was about 17, when I left school, I took myself to the nightclubs and I introduced myself to musicians and I, I'm Shona and I'm a singer. And I got my first gig in a band called Purple Vision. Wow. Singing, take another little piece of my heart. And uh, I, they loved me at the nightclub and they asked me to come to their to their band rehearsal which was in Lakemba. Now I'm a girl from the eastern suburbs so I thought Lakemba was like <laughs> I don't know I, I thought it was like a, I thought you had to have a passport to get there anyway I made my sister come with me and we went to this rehearsal and I sang it and they took me aside and they said you know you were really good at the nightclub but today you weren't so good and I was like oh my god but anyway I went on with that band and that was kind of like the start of my my journey into being in the music business. And I worked with some great people and had some incredible experiences. And then it just kind of flowed on from there. You know, one thing led to another thing, as happens with life. You it know. does. Shauna, who would you say are your main musical influences? Well, definitely Aretha Franklin, number one. Gladys Knight, uh, Whitney Houston, um, Patti LaBelle, um, Stevie Wonder, um, Sam and Dave, all the old school R&B, the music that I was listening to when I grew up. And I still listen to, I listen to a lot of different types of music. I listen to um, rock and I listen to soul music and I listen to R&B and I, I I can't say that I'm very excited about very many people that I see that are mm. new these days. I, I quite like Lizzo and I, you know, of course I love Gaga and I, I, you know, I love Deborah Cox and I love all the house music divas and I couldn't say there was one. If there was one, if I had to say one, it would be Aretha Franklin. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Now, Shona, you were in the original oh, okay. cast. Chin, chin. Now, you were in the original cast of Jesus Christ Superstar. How did that come about? Uh, well, I was, I was in probably the first house that I lived in when I left home. And I was living in, sharing the house with a trombone player. And his friend was the musical director of Jesus Christ Superstar. And they went out and they, they had cast the show and they went out on a six week tour. Oh no, hang on, that wasn't what happened. They cast the show and Michael Carlos was putting the band together and he wanted the band when they went into the show to sound incredible. So he, I, I had met Michael and Michael said, I want you to be in the show, but I can't put you in straight away. Why don't you come and sing with this house band? Which was an amazing, band absolutely incredible band of musicians and john english was the singer wow and we did this residency in in Kuji at a hotel that no longer exists and um and then as soon as the show opened then i went to the first audition which was within a month and i got in and i learned so much and I have friends from that time that I'm still friends mm. with. Yeah, we were, we were definitely a kind of hippie tribe. Definitely, smoking joints, hanging out, hanging out on the weekends together, and it was an amazing show. And it was, I learned so much about stagecraft and about singing with other people and listening to people around me, and. Um, learning to always up my game because Harry and Miller was the producer mm. and Harry would come, you know, and this is an incredible production, like 
Jim Sharman, Patrick Flynn was the um, was the main musical director. Jim Sharman was the was the director of the show. Harry and Miller was the producer, and we would get a, a note. You know, a cast and uh, all the uh, cast are to assemble on the stage immediately after the show, and you'd go, "Oh fuck, what's going on now?" And you'd go downstairs, and Harry was there, and Harry would say things like, "If you think." that that was a good fucking show, you've got nuts in your head or something, and he would make you feel so bad. And we would have thought we just did an incredible show, a great vibe, everyone loved it. And he would bring you, bam, down to earth to make you then up your game, better yourself, be better, always be better. And, um, yeah, that was what that was all about. It was good. I did do a few... I did another show in Melbourne called Two Gentlemen of Verona, which which had come out from the States. And I did another hideous show called Let My People Come, which I don't want to talk about. Um, we won't go there. But I, the thing about doing music theatre was as much as I learned from it, what I did learn from it was that I didn't like doing the same thing night after night after night after night, show after show. I didn't like the discipline. Mm. Of, of having to sing it exactly the same every single night because I, you know, and having said that, you know, in my career, I don't think as a soloist I've ever sung a song the same way twice, ever, ever. But, of course, doing backing vocals, you have to, to a certain degree, sing the same thing every night the same way. But it was a diff that's a different kind of discipline altogether. Now you talk about that. You talk about backing vocals and being a solo singer. You've worked with some amazing people as a backing mm. vocalist. Jimmy Barnes, Cold Chisel, Noise Works, Richard yeah. Clapton. Oh, so yeah. when you're a solo singer, how different is the discipline from being a backing singer? How do you stay in the background when it's something you love and passionate about? Well, you're part of a group. Once again, you're, you're part of something. And when you so how I started how I got into doing backing vocals was after I had done uh, Superstar when I, I think maybe when I was doing Superstar there were four or six of us the boys from Air Supply my friend Maggie McKinney and maybe another guy we started getting asked to do jingles television commercials and and uh, so we got into that. And so I was doing quite a bit of studio work and I got asked to do Jimmy's album. I had done quite a few different albums, tracks on albums. I can't even remember what they were. I did so many. And then I got asked to do Jimmy's album. And then when I did Jimmy's album, it was his first album out of Cold Chisel. And so he mm. then wanted to take that sound onto the road with him. So I got to I got to do that. And so you don't want to be your job is not to be the lead singer. Your job is to be that 20 feet from stardom, if you don't mind me paraphrasing that. Your job is to enhance the sound of the of the star and you do that and I was able to do that well because of my previous previous experiences doing Superstar and all the other shows mm -hmm. and learning to listen and so if so when you're working with somebody as a backing vocalist you this the the part might be blah 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 but mm. they might sing it blah, blah, blah. And so you hear that and then you match that. And because I was able to do that and I was I have a great ear for harmony um, and I was able to do that so well, then I went on and I toured with Jimmy for, you know, almost 30 years, I think, and on and off. And when I wasn't touring with Jimmy, I would tour with Richard Clapton. And when I wasn't doing with Richard Clapton, then I, you know, I did a Noiseworks album and they wanted to take that sound mm. on the road. So then I toured with them and... And, you know, touring life in Australia is very different to what you would imagine. You know, you see big bands in the States touring and they've got the buses and the, we don't have, it's not like that. You're in the, you're in a Tarago, you know, getting to a motel and, you know, it's, it's quite difficult. 
But I've done some fantastic, I've worked with some fantastic people. <clears throat> I did a tour. Who are your favourites? Sorry? Who are your favourites? Well, Jimmy, of course. Jimmy and Noise Works. I loved working with Richard. I loved Richard's music um, because Richard Clapton's music was so, so lyrical. And I loved working with Noise Works because I'd, I'd worked with John Stevens in the studio when he first came out to Australia from New Zealand. His management company were the same management company that I was with, the same same people, and they put him into the studio. And so I had done a Quite a bit of work with John with John so that was how I I kind of worked with got in there and did their album and um and because I was well known I, I have such a black rich sound and I don't mean to be disparaging people of color but I I have a, a very rich sound to my voice that that does bring a certain uh sound so I you know I was very popular and I was able to work with people who were also able to deliver that kind of of sound that fat sound like I worked with Powderfinger as well and I toured with um I did a tour called Long Way to the Top a few years ago and oh. that was that was working with all the stars from the 60s 70s and 80s and I got to work with the most incredible people and I was Amazing. on stage for three hours and I, it was, you know, I've it, did all those things that I did working with Jimmy, he would, you know, we were on every major arena in Australia and noise works as well, but I got to do duets with Jimmy. So duet, wow. Jimmy was very generous with his stage. So, you know, I got to just show people what I could do and, and I got the biggest mm -hmm. rock star in Australia to validate me. I love Jimmy even Barr. Though when he wrote, even though when he wrote his book, I became invisible. Thank you very much. That we, won't go there. Yes. we get air you know, from Yes, exactly. But you know, I, I love Jimmy Barnes. Um, I moved back to London a few years ago, and I'm one of those karaoke singers. And I brought my working class man CD, and I used to sing working class man. And I used to convince people I wrote the song, and of course they believed me because they don't really know Cold Chisel over there or Jimmy Barnes. Uh, but one time there was an Australian. It was a pub in London, and afterwards she was in tears, and I said why are you in tears? She said, I've been in London seven years. This is the first time I felt homesick. I said, was, was I that bad? No, she said it was just hearing Jimmy Barnes, a Jimmy Barnes song. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, you know, that song is quite iconic. And he, when he wrote that song, um, I'm just, just trying to think of the lyric in my head. When he, uh, we're going to make a baby on the rain. There was a, there was a, there was a, across the wild midwestern sky yeah. was the original lyric and he changed it to across the wild australian sky and it just yeah. changed it for everybody and i must say being on stage with jimmy and cold chisel and watching the thousands of people singing every note every word and often quite incorrectly um was just you know just fantastic and you know working with jimmy was great and and all of those experiences that I had working with all of those different artists, there was something that, that made me, mm. gave me skills to become the performer and the confident performer that I am, even though I was always confident. And I always had my own band in those days. I used to have a band at a club called Springfields, which was in King's Cross. And mm -hmm. it was like an after hours and everyone would come there to get their drugs and drink till seven in the morning we didn't even start till one in the morning and we used Love to have it. bands all the touring bands used to come in and they would get up and jam like Fleetwood Mac and blah 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 big noty um and all those experiences you know every experience we have is the sum of who we are today so you know I'm very very blessed that I've been able to do all that although I don't get hired anymore why too old, it, yeah, too we're old gonna, apparently we're, we're gonna talk about that very soon ageism but you were about to tell me before i asked about jimmy barnes about a tour you went on 
it's gone. <laughs> My brain is like a sea. Oh, There's a lot of questions. Way to the top. Oh, long way to the top. When I was on long way to the top, when I toured with that that tour, I got to work with three women who were the first three pop stars in Australia: Little Patty, Dinah Lee, and Judy Stone. And those women broke the glass ceiling for pop stars. And I worked with, and they, the stories that they told on the road, you know, we were, we were touring, we were on buses, we were on planes. When we did the country tour, we were on a bus and we got to talk a lot. And it was just, I felt so honored to be mm. there with those people and singing and my friend Max Merritt, who just passed away, you know, I was a huge fan of his. And then I got to work with him. And when I was in my first band, that band I was telling you about, Purple Vision, one of the big gigs that we did was at this this nightclub called The Here in North Sydney that was owned by a mafioso, August Marinese. And I was literally 17. I was definitely 17. And it was the kind of nightclub where the bouncers used to wear jackets this thick yep. and they carried pieces and knives and guns, I'm sure. And so I, and I remember one day one of them coming and picking me up and putting me in the corner of the club and saying, don't move, because it was a fight. There was going to be some kind of drama. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, we did a support for Billy Thorpe. And Billy Thorpe was at the time the biggest rock star. He was the Jimmy Barnes of the 60s, 70s, 80s. And um, and it was such an honour. And I was like, oh, it's Billy Thorpe. And he used to have harmonicas that he used to keep in vodka and all these mm -hmm. kinds of things. And when I did Long Way to the Top, Billy was one of the producers. And I had the opportunity to tell Billy that I had worked with him then. Of course, he didn't remember. And that how much it had you know, like impacted on me as, as stardom and he was just so blown away. And then I ended up singing on his very last album that he made before he passed away. So it was a beautiful circle, a beautiful circle of life. It really was, you know, a musical circle. So that was that was one of my favourite tours was Long Way to the Top. But all my tours with Jimmy, most of my tours with Jimmy, Noise Works and, and you know, not all of them with Richard Clapton. He's not my favourite person, but... Um, you know, he's a great songwriter and I loved singing those songs. Now, Shona, mm. you've been described as a lesbian, a gay icon, and we love you for it. <laughs> but you performed, believe it or not, you performed at the opening ceremony and the closing parties of the 2002 Sydney Gay Games. What was that like and how did you get involved? Amazing. Um, I had released, <clears throat> excuse me, I had released um, a track with Paul Goodyear called Take Me to Heaven in 2000, 1999, 2000. And so I had been performing, doing quite a bit of work on the scene and uh, they wanted to have, you know, Australian content and they approached me to do the opening ceremony um and uh they loved me and they you know they wanted me to be part of it and gil minavini who's an incredible event producer was producing that segment mm. and she came to me and she said we that was in that um bit that you showed before with me in the purple dress with all of the ballroom dancers and it was there were thirty thousand people and they said to me we want you to sing you've got to be by Desiree and I was like really I don't really like that song but anyway the more I the more I I sang it I recorded it and they went off and they all rehearsed with it and then I went into a rehearsal at Marrickville Town Hall with all the dancers and I sang it live to the backing track and as I said before I don't sing anything the same way twice and it completely threw them that I sang it differently so I had to look because a lot of them were going off vocal cues rather than counting or what anybody would do so I had to learn to sing that song exactly the same and it's probably the only song that I do sing that I pretty much sing exactly the same now because I had to and um so I went to every rehearsal and I think it was I had Probably I was already a meditator by that stage. Mm. I had learned to meditate and 
I was um, I I had learned about having the quantum experience. So learning to actually live the experience all the time. So I went to every rehearsal that was available, even if it was just a walk through to go and see the set built and I would go home and I would lie in my bed and I would sing the song as if the audience was there. I would sing it in my head, sing it in my head. And so by the time I actually got there on the day, I was, I was quite calm and really happy and excited and, and it was a it was a really really fantastic night. And then I did the closing ceremony. It wasn't closing, it wasn't closing ceremony. It was a closing party, dance party, in the RHI. And it had been in the RHI in the Horden, and they'd closed the Horden down. It must have been eight o'clock or ten o'clock in the morning. I can't remember back in the day where these close parties at ten. And the laser. I was coming up out of the floor on a riser. And the laser company had just got all these new lasers in and I could just see like this over the uh, the stage was there and all I could see were the tallest people in the room's hands going like this. And the laser guy was going crazy because it was the last song of the party and he was showing off his lasers and there were just lasers everywhere and it was just amazing. And I was singing mm. um, the Three Degrees song, When Will I See You Again? Beautiful. And the show song started and all the dancers were dunk, dancing all around and I came up out of this riser and there were 10,000 people in there and this scream of people and there's nothing like doing a show in the RHI I have to tell you it's quite an amazing experience one of the we've greatest also, experiences of my life we've also seen you perform at Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras and the Harbour Party but many of us will know you as the voice of some of our favourite commercials would have been your own favourites <laughs> um look i can't really say that i have favorite commercials but that was during the time when in the 80s when i was doing a lot of studio work um before i started doing album tracks i was doing a lot of jingles so i did television commercials for every kind of product and uh not like I don't think that there's very many jingles on tele commercial television today that you would actually be able to sing. But no. in those days, they they wrote these little mini songs. And I did the, the Suzanne, this goes with this goes with this goes with this. I did that and I did, there's no other store like David Jones and uh, Coca-Cola, too many Coca-Cola ads and KFC ads and McDonald's ads and you know, Tui's football, or just everything. And and when I was putting my first cabaret show together, Trevor Ashley said to me, you have to do a medley. He, Trevor was putting the show Absolutely. together for me. And said to me, you have to do a medley of all your ads. And I was, it took me about two weeks to try and remember because I, sometimes I would do three a day. And my daughter would, I would come home to Avalon and my daughter would say, what did you do today, mum? And I'm like, oh, I can't remember. Because they were just... They were just ads. I didn't give them much credo, you know, because they were just ads. But they're but, so patchy, and we re we remember them, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And I and I am always surprised every time I do that medley, how many people just go, "Oh my god!" You know, everyone knows those ads. And when I watched the history of Kerry Packer and cricket, and they showed they had this whole scene scenario in that telly movie about going to mojo who were the advertising company and creating the jingle mm. because they changed cricket they changed cricket from being test cricket to one day cricket and so they had to make ads about it jingles yeah. and they did the come on aussie come on ad and uh and i didn't realize until i saw that telly movie that i was part of history Mm. I had that, you know, it's like you just, you just, just a job and you're just doing it. And, and now I'm part of an ARIA award winning telly wow. film of, um, of Helen Reddy. I did all the backing vocals on the Helen Reddy really? movie, which has been out, which has now been uh, nominated for an ARIA. So, it's with Michael Tan. So, very, very, you know, happy about that to still be doing that at my age. 
<laughs> now, Shona, you've also been a judge on Pop Stars Live and All Together Now and also a panellist on Beauty and the Beast. How did that come about and what are your favourite memories of it, of doing those shows? I became, well, I became a panellist on Beauty and the Beast because I happened to be judging the Mardi Gras Parade, as they always have awards for the Mardi Gras Parade, and I happened to be judging. And Gil Minervini, again, she had, had, had a bit of a profile with Foxtel, and Foxtel were doing, she was on Beauty and the Beast, and Foxtel were doing the live foot live coverage. And she came over and interviewed me, and I was just on, and I was fabulous. And uh, my a friend of mine was the director, was directing that telecast, and he, was also directing Beauty and the Beast. And he said, you have to do Beauty and the Beast. We have to have you on. Mm. So I went on for a year and that was, I, I was, I had done a lot of television. I had been on the Mike Wall show, the midday show and every, who every, every host over the years. Mm. And so going on television and singing, I was quite used to, yes. um, even though it was nerve wracking, I was quite used to it. Um, but to go on television and actually talk, and to be mm. asked my opinion was terrifying at first, absolutely terrifying. And um, but I got used to it, and I kind of worked out how it went. And I remember saying to to one of the panelists who was um, really very controversial because she was she was mm. and she still is Prue Prue McSween. And I remember saying to her one day, "Please don't come for me because I'll cry and you'll look bad because I can't." confrontation so she never did she said, okay thanks thanks for letting me know because that was their job that was her job was, was. to do that you know yeah, and so pop stars uh pop stars i kind of fell into being a judge i was i was actually hired as the um vocal coach okay. and they it was a weird they changed the format and they had all these people uh, other pop stars on there picking the the auditionees and mm. of being on the panel and it wasn't rating well and I was very I just told it like it was in vocal coaching because yeah. we were on camera all the time and I don't suffer fools and um I would tell it like it was and the production the producers came to me and they said we want you to be on air and do you have a nasty nickname I was like no you can't call me a chunt on television on channel seven i don't think so. <laughs> no, doesn't happen no and anyway so they wanted me to come on and be like the nasty judge and like this how simon cowell was and mm. they were doing anything for ratings and in fact they paid me a shitload of money never signed me to a contract wow and um and so I just made money and just got dressed up. And and that footage that you showed earlier of me seeing Natural Woman, my friend was the director and he stretched the film so I looked so skinny. Oh, no. <laughs> All together now, how did that come about? Um, I, Again, I was approached. They were looking for people to do it. I wasn't doing anything. It was absolutely shit money. Mm -hmm. um, and... They basically were just paying a basic kind of fee and a lot of singers around Sydney said, no, we shouldn't be doing it for that kind of money. And, yeah, you know, they were right to a certain point. But I just thought, well, I could be sitting at home. They did in, shot it in eight, nine days or something like that, mm. ten days. And I thought, well, I could be sitting at home doing nothing or I could be going being on television. Exactly. And so that's what I chose to do. And I met some great people and had a fantastic time and, you know, it was an interesting format and, um, yeah, it was kind of fun. You know, it was all right. It was a job. We've got a few minutes left and I must ask you about ageism and sexism and fatism in the music right. business and also on the LGBTQI scene. What have been your experiences right. and why is it so important to you? Look, it's important to me because I think ageism is a really big issue that we have right across the board in the whole lgbtqia plus community um where our elders are not really respected and i think mm. that has to change i don't know how that ch is going to change but i think it's got to change i think that there's a lot of a lot of what's happening within our community now 
is kind of being taken over by queer artists. So if you're not young and thin or fat mm. with your tits out, you're not going to get a job in cabaret. Mm. And there's there's a lot. Look, size size has always been an issue for women. Age has always been an issue for women. Mm. You know, it's a youth and beauty industry. That's the bottom line. It's a youth and beauty industry, but it is changing. And there are fantastic people like Jamila Jamil, who has the Iway community, people like Lizzo, who I fucking love her, gets out there in her lingerie with her ass sticking out and, you know, is just, just twerking and being fantastic and loving her body. And so there's a big movement in body positivity. But there's also the other side of that, the darker side of that, is that people are saying, Body positivity is just fat people trying to make an excuse for being pigs and Awful. eating too much. And Horrible. you just need to go on a diet. Why don't you just stop eating so much? Why don't you just why don't you just fuck off? That's it's my response tough. to that. You know? Mm -hmm. Like if, if if in a what tell me what's perfect. There is no perfection. So the horrible. media the media, as you know, is controlled by this 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 thing of do you ever see an older news reader do you ever see mm. anybody on television who is be a woman who is beyond a size six no you do not age, do you age. see a man an older man and a fatter mm. man totally yeah women no so that's got to change but it won't Absolutely. change when you've got the people who are the powers that be in commercial television running it you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, and, and mm. we need to change the mindset by, you know, I, I look at Lizzo and I think I want to be, I want to just love my body and love all my curves, but I've been mm. so ingrained mm. into thinking that it's not pretty, that it, it's really hard for me to love my body. So I just so, eat more chocolate. So the, the media <laughs> drink really more has. Wine. I love it. And a bit of water for me. And so the media really has to change its outlook and its way of thinking because the media often influences how people feel. I, I know I'm a male and I've been in bars and my weight fluctuates. I've had people come up to me and pinch my stomach and go, little piggy. And, and they seem to feel that's acceptable. Strangers. I mean, you know, I know. I know. And it, it's, it's, you know, that... Uh, I, I had a conversation with somebody uh, earlier this year at a gig um, in January and he said to me, and I was talking about not getting hired anymore by these mm. musicians who are my age who are hiring younger singers, but all the musicians in the band are all my age, but the women, mm. he said, nobody wants to look at a fat woman. Terrible. Everybody wants to look at a young, pretty thing. And I just said, well, there's ageism and, you know, fatism, if there's such it's a word, appalling. right there. And, and, uh, but who is making those decisions? Mm. Men, straight men. Always men, straight men. Absolutely. We've got a couple more minutes left. Shauna, what advice would you give for singers starting out today, particularly within our own LGBTIQ community? Hmm. What advice would I give? is set your sights as high as you possibly can and go for your dreams and live your life and be real and fuck don't take no for an answer and just go for it because you deserve it you are fantastic you are a star you are brilliant and just keep doing it keep doing it believe in yourself you gotta Beautiful. believe in yourself and Shauna, is there any advice you would have given your younger self? Yeah, don't eat the chocolate. <laughs> it's my mistake. <laughs> don't eat the sugar. Don't get a taste for the sugar. Any advice? Yeah, look, you know, I think, I think um, any advice for my younger self? Yes, I think that I would tell myself to be that that there are going to be a lot of trials along the way and that you can if you just believe in yourself and don't doubt yourself you will 
you will be successful. You will be okay. You will get above it. Don't believe everything that your parents are telling you, that you're stupid, that you're an idiot, because you're not. You're a smart, intelligent, funny, gorgeous person. That's the advice I'd give me. My daughter's in the background going, yes, mother, yes. 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 <laughs> so what does the future hold for you? I know, I don't mean to give you a crystal ball, but have you got anything coming up soon? Any gigs? I don't have any gigs until I've got an online gig for Lemons, 21st birthday in a couple of weeks, which will be really fun. Um, and then I have a live gig in, I have my Christmas shows at Claire's. I do a, an annual Christmas show, which is hilarious. And will I be naughty or nice? I will be both. Yes. Both. And that's in the six, 16th, around 16th of December. And then goodness knows what's going to happen next year. Who knows? Well, Who knows? Best of luck. I'll probably do a few more online shows. I don't know. I hope so. And I hope we'll have more gigs like the one I saw at Pado RSL the other week and also Claire's so Kitchen too. on Oxford Street. Um, also, how can we find, lastly, a bit more about you? Do you have a website or a Facebook page? I have Shauna Jensen Music on Facebook. And um, that's where anybody who's interested in what I'm doing can go. Um, I don't accept friend requests on my private page on, on Facebook because there's too many weirdos out there. Um, and yeah, no, I don't have a website. I'm completely like tech. I don't know how to do tech. I don't well, know. all your energy goes into the music. All your energy goes into the singing. And, and that's what all my I love energy just goes into walking on the beach these days. I'm kind of semi-retired, I think. And, you know, hanging out with my family is the most important thing to me. I love my family, my dog, my new rescue dog, and um, just, you know, living my best life. Living my best life like you are, William. And thank That's you so much for having me. Shauna, oh. I want to say to you, I've been wanting to approach you to be on our show for so long, and I thought, will she say yes? Will she say no? You said yes. So I'm just so appreciative, and I mean that. I really do mean that. And thanks for your great music. I've seen you a number of times, including at the Sydney Opera House with Trevor Ashley a couple of years back. Amazing. Amazing. I've seen and you I, just sold out the, I just sold out the Sydney Opera House last year with my Aretha Franklin show too. Congratulations. Big. And Thank hopefully you. I will see you live, as will our audience very, very soon at a gig and a venue near you. But Shauna, thank you so much for joining us here on At Home on InView TV. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, InView TV. Love you, William. Thank you so much. You. Stay safe. You. And you too, and you're always welcome back. Wow. Shauna Jensen, the star, the singer, the voice herself here on At Home on InView TV. What a fantastic show. I've absolutely enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Before we go, I must thank my executive producer, Bruce Mott, and of course, Shauna Jensen, our guest, singing sensation. But most of all, I want to thank you for your support. Without you, we wouldn't have a show. You are absolutely amazing. You are fantastic and you are awesome. And we really appreciate you being there. And I hope you've enjoyed the show. We are here regularly on a Wednesday evening and we hope to see you again soon. I'll be back next week. We've got Mary Kiani, another fantastic Scottish born Australian singer and she will be on at home on Indie TV. But in the meantime, from me, William Broom in Sydney, have a fantastic week and an amazingly fabulous weekend. Talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye bye for now. <laughs>